thanks for having me again. Uh, I want to share a little bit of my recent journey these past few months that was precipitated by a course that I took, a nine-week online course that was facilitated, uh, created, and led by uh, some brothers in the Mankind Project who are part of a group called Elders for Climate Justice. And they've been meeting and working. That's their personal and collective mission now for, I don't know, six or seven years or more. Uh, and this course was born out of that collaboration. And one of the things that the course, which was titled, uh, still is titled Resilience and Acceptance in the Face of Collapse, one of the things the course did for me was organize a lot of my existing information and experience uh, in the world and about the world that I have been living with for a long time, but didn't um, didn't have enough of a context for to make my experience and my knowledge useful. And I feel like the course gave me a, a framework to connect the dots of what I know about history and politics and um, and world affairs and not just history, but present times and also the future. Uh, because it, it put um, my life in civilization into context and it put civilization into the historical context of the rise and maturity and decline of civilizations that sociologists have long since recognized a life cycle to civilizations that and uh, that nobody's particularly immune to that developmental cycle of course if we think about it nothing is immune to a developmental cycle in the universe everything is born and grows or expands and then it declines and entropy exists and so we kind of know about that um I, today, I, I just want to invite some inquiry. I want to uh, invite some discovery about how shall we then live is really what this is about. Um, what are the implications of some of the questions that I'm going to pose to you for what we then do? Uh, and so this is in the form of a series of questions. It's not a formal presentation, but it is a short introduction to the work of William R. Catton Jr., that's C-A-T-T-O-N, who was a sociologist at the at Washington State University, as it turns out, <clears throat> not that far from where I've now I now live. And his book, Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change, was actually published in 1980, but I never heard about it, which is amazing. Uh, given that I think it's probably the most important book I've read um, in my lifetime. Um, certainly one of the top three, but I think it's, I think it's number one. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to um, give a shout out to Dr. Catton, um, who was way ahead of his time um, and uh, reinforced my respect for the domain of sociology. So, some some time ago here in the mastery circle i was uh, did a presentation in which i was speculating about what would an idea be what kind of big enough idea would have the power that, to draw us outside of ourselves and also to help us gain some perspective on the the world that we live in the, the crises that we face the struggles that exist around us um and i was talking about um, the, the possible influence of recognizing the existence of extraterrestrials as an example of such a uh, a powerful idea. Well, this is another perspective, but this perspective isn't coming from the outside. It's coming more from the inside of our own history and a revision of that history. Uh, and I would say that personally, I've usually thought about history as a political explanation of things who has had power and who um, who did what to whom and, um, you know, hegemony, who, who has been 
uh, taking over uh, from other people. That, that's the way I've thought about history. It's a, it's a history of war, basically. But that's I, but what the root causes of that are were not something that I particularly got um, enough understanding of, I don't think. The, the subtitle of this talk today, um, Ecological History of the Earth, is The Loss of Our Innocence Explained. And so that is one of the benefits of this course that I took, uh, is that I feel like I understand that idea better. So um, how many of you, this is a rhetorical question, although you can stick your hand up. How many of you remember the 50s and the early 60s? And if you ask yourself, what are the adjectives to describe the aspirations or the expectations of those years, what would you say? And go ahead and take yourself off mute and give me a few adjectives. So this is not rhetorical. What adjectives would describe the 50s and the, and the early 60s in terms of the um, zeitgeist and aspirations of the time? Home and family for the 50s. Home and family? Optimistic. Optimistic. Thank you, Brooke. Explosive growth. Thank you, Michael. Innocent. Did I hear innocence? <laughs> Idealism. Idealism. Thank you, Afton. And innocence. Patri patriotism. Patriotism. In the 60s, uh, women's reproductive freedom. Women's reproductive freedom. Uh, freedom being a key word there. Okay, so that's kind of what I was expecting you all might say about that. Uh, so what is the presumed source of or the attributed cause of such optimism? Do you have a word or phrase? Not Please, not a paragraph, because I want to hear from several people. What's the presumed source or cause of that optimism? War. Oh, optimism. No. Yeah. Freedom, uh, relief after the war. Mm -hmm. Relief after the, the war? Hope. New technology and new jobs. Thank you. Belief in those? Yes. And the reality of those? Yeah. Anything else? Television and the comedy shows and the innocence of television compared to now. Yeah, so was that a cause of the optimism? Or was that a furthering of the optimism that existed? An expression of it. Well, An also, of it. Thomas, the GI Bill that basically made people, in effect, wealthy or middle class overnight. Okay. And <clears throat> was that a cause or was that an expression? Um, for many people, it was simply a a cause of optimism. Okay, gotcha. All the right. That the the uh, the current generation would rise a higher standard of life than their than their parents. Yeah. Okay. So that's the key, Afton, that I I would like to highlight or draw on from this. Whatever the cause or the source of this. There was the expectation that the future was bountiful, that we were going to rise into a better condition than our parents. And there was a sense of an unlimited possibility then, both spiritually, morally, and economically. At least that's what I lived through. Uh, that's what I believed. And I hear a lot of you also partook of that. Now, that is a privileged position to take. That is the posture of people who were raised in North America and came uh, up through the middle class or somewhere near the middle class. This is not the story of people from other cultures and in dire economic circumstances. Although I believe the U.S. did try to sell that myth to and promote that through the World Bank and the IMF and other things, you know, take out loans with us and you will increase your standard of living. But 
I get a little more into the political now, which is my favorite point of view all these years. So what's the source of this optimism? So what did we learn about the story of the founding of the U.S.? And what was the story of Columbus' discovery of the, quote, new world, unquote? What was that? And what's the story of, of westward expansion once we got to the new world, this history that I was taught growing up? Like manifest destiny? Yes, sort of. That's one of the laws that allowed that expansion to occur. Along with that is the belief that we could make the world a better place by our manifest destiny. Yeah, yeah, that we're superior to the other folks whose land we're taking over. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we will be an improvement to it. But wh what drove the Europeans to come to the New World? S search for freedom. Seeking, okay. yeah, freedom of yeah. religion. Sir. Right, that's the story we were told. And that's a wonderful, noble story. But what else was going on? What were the hopes and expectations economically? Well, the Spanish were looking for gold. They're looking for resources. They're looking for resources to have power and uh, management of people and making the people that have the money to, to do that. Right. Okay. So we're looking for resources because resources mean power and they mean power over. And it means also the ability to get more resources to have an unlimited expansion of resources. It, them that gots is them that gets, as the song goes. Okay, so uh, now we're, we're beginning to think about history and the expansion of the British Empire. The, the sun never sets on the British Empire because the expansion has been so successful. And the expansion to the new world as if the world were new Mm -hmm. which of course it isn't, it wasn't. And the calling it an expansion is gratuitous. Mm -hmm. So here comes, here comes William Catton. He's got an ecological view of history. And what he, he thinks in terms of natural cycles and the ecological principles of which we are all uh, participants that there's nothing in the universe that is apart from the biosphere or the, the ecology, the, the laws of ecologies, nothing is apart from it. We're all interconnected irrevocably, and I believe intelligently. In, so what is, what is driving this expansion? Well, he would say that it's about takeover. It's one group of people taking over resources from another group of people or taking over resources from a land that is not their own. So the principle of takeover is central to his thesis. Thomas. And that, and that all expansion is actually a cloak for takeover. But it's not just, so takeover is one way to have more resources. And when you think more resources, you can think of cheap resources, temporarily cheap resources. And you can think oil, energy, as the hallmark of that. Cheap oil, cheap energy, temporarily fuels the expansion of the empire and the takeover of the, quote, new world. It's cheap energy that allows all of that. And the expansion is seeking cheaper energy the whole time. Now, this, if you think of it in terms of food rather than oil, and you go back in history, and, you, and this is what Catton says, you look at the same ecological principle, then humans have always been looking for an advantage in their environment. This is not a political, moral conversation. It's an ecological one. That every living, every group, every species, every group of living things 
has sought to maximize its advantage in the that's not a good thing or bad thing. It's just the ecological principle. We we seek the boundaries. We look for more food. We look for advantages in acquiring food. And we get better at acquiring food than the other inhabitants of our local biosphere, our local environment. We get better than they are. And we succeed at their expense. Now, we may be succeeding at the expense of an insect or a four-legged, another mammal, maybe. But we're succeeding at the expense of somebody, maybe another tribe of humans. When our brains get bigger, historically, we have advantages in the hunt. And when we learn how to cultivate crops, we also have an advantage over the natural selection process of um, who has enough to eat. Now, hoarding of energy is equivalent to hoarding food. Hoarding any resource is a condition that he calls overshoot. It's when we take more than we need, but also we take more than the earth actually has to give us, more than any given population uh, has under its feet. So he, he, he has a whole new language for how to understand ecological history of the world and he has terms like um take over and draw down and ghost acreage that if you think about the food that we eat as homo colossus and i'll explain that species reference in a minute that the, the food that we eat doesn't come from the acreage that we stand on it comes from other acreage. It comes from ghost acreage that's either somewhere else or it's from another time and place. So petrochemicals are, you could say, food or energy that comes from another time and place. It comes from the past, but we're taking it from the future. We're using up what the future might otherwise have as a resource. Take over, draw down, ghost acreage we're living off of acreage that that we don't have it's coming from somewhere else in space or time now homo colossus is a term i think catton might have might have termed it and this is where technology comes into the conversation as long as humans have been around we have used our brains once we had them of a certain capacity and an opposable thumb We've used that to create some kind of advantage in the hunt and the acquisition of resources. And note, there's no blame here. There's no blame and shame. The whole ecological accounting of our history is not one of blaming some other group as being a bad group. It's the principle that all of us have lived in as humans or as living things uh, on the earth. So Homo Colossus is the concept that we, we're no longer the species of Homo sapiens where one person collects the food necessary for one person or one's own family. We're now amplifying our own reach. So the first person who figured out that a sling could throw a rock or a spear farther than we could ordinarily throw it, that was a technological advance. That gave that group of humans an advantage in feeding their population. And then being clever enough to store things, use fire to cook things, preserve things, gave another advantage. And so humans expanded their footprint on the earth by virtue of the technological advances of relative to their neighbors. Is that a question, Michael? Yes, it is. Um, the way you're speaking about this brings a, a, a significant question to mind, which is you're almost suggesting that somehow or other the capability to raise food is in some ways a kind of a fixed uh, content or a fixed ability, which is expendable 
And this book was written in 1980, which is 45 years ago. Uh, it is before any of the current technological framework existed. And also it is before many of the current um, agricultural advances and growth advances of, of agriculture. I mean, the ability of our, our country to grow as it has, um, has been directly related to the ability of our country to become much more productive in agricultural production. Not only in this country, but around the world, the population of our, the world is now 8 billion people. Now, whatever you think about that, Thomas, the fact that you have 8 billion people living on the planet bespeaks the fact that we have in, dramatically increased agricultural productivity. Now, Which you can, is precisely you the can problem. Say, no, wait a minute. You can say that's borrowing from the future. But you also have to admit that a lot of that is dramatically streamlining through technology what we have available. So if that's follow, one of the so arguments. Michael, I, Michael, I want you to stop here because I hear your counter argument. And in that, car, that counter argument is very well covered by Catton in his book if you read it through the end. Mm -hmm. the, the point I'm just making notice is that technology did not begin in, the, in 1980 or 85. Technology began way, way back when humans were smart enough to gain an advantage in the environment. Mm -hmm. And technology is not only not the fix for overshoot, it's a major contributor to overshoot precisely because it allows individual humans or groups of humans to acquire far more resources than they otherwise could have. So that, in fact, causes, as you note, a population explosion. And the population explosion is now a major contributor to the crisis of overshoot. It's not the solution, it's the cause. So that's what I mean when I say that's why the, the book is so important. It flips the cause on its head. It For me, it, it took technology into a completely different context of it's not actually the solution it is the driving force behind homo colossus so to finish that thought it's not just the sling and the arrow it's the automobile it's the airplane it's the agricultural systems of um, major agribusiness all of those extensions of me that make me colossally larger of a footprint than I would otherwise be, all of those technological advances are actually creating overshoot because I'm consuming way more of the resources on the planet than I otherwise would. So technology makes me so much bigger. That's what Homo Colossus means. And it means my footprint is bigger. The implication of this is chilling because it is suggesting that civilization is the culprit, that technological advancement in an exploding population is precisely what the difficulty is. But it, it goes beyond just that principle because this material appears in the collapse literature, which is suggesting that once a civilization gets this far down the road in overshoot with this large a footprint, it, it cannot reverse itself. And we were talking about simplification at a personal level, and I've been talking about that too. It's, it's simply not an option to de-advance civilization in such a way <clears throat> that our footprint will be manageable, not with the population figures as exploded as they are. Now, the implication of this <clears throat> is that if you put climate change into this conversation, what's the ultimate cause, cause of climate change? Well, most people in the movies are going to say it's humans. We're the only species that causes this. No other species does. And the way we caused it was by having too big a footprint, consuming too many resources. Again, there's no blame, no shame. The point is here in the ecological history, revision history, is that all species do the same thing. 
All species seek an advantage. They maximize their population. And ecologists know that populations grow and recede. Lemmings, you know, they overpopulate and then they shrink. Wolves, rabbits, deer, they expand and they contract. When they, when they have an advantage, they, they expand, they multiply. And then at some point they overpopulate, ecological principle, self-correction. There's a shrinkage back down to what's appropriate or manageable or proportionate. Now, I know this is not a fun conversation. If you're a Scorpio, you're going to think this is really neat. Or if you're a Plutonian, because this is a taboo subject. You bring this up, you don't get invited back to the cocktail parties. But from another point of view, it's just the science. It's just the science of ecology. It's the principle wherein we are included in the laws of ecology rather than separate from them. Now, I want to do a time check here. Yeah, okay, so I, I want to I flip it out to discussion. This I just want to throw out some ideas, raise some questions. Um, I've, I've proposed an alternative cause to the existential crisis that the women were talking about the last two weeks here in Mastery Circle. They all referred to an existential crisis. What is that exactly? I mean, it's beyond climate change, but it certainly incorporates climate change. What do we then do with the stuff I'm talking about? What's, what's the point? I mean, it's pretty chilling to, to look at the science in this way. And I would say a couple of things that if we don't look into the abyss and see what's there, it's going to be very difficult to know what to do. If we don't have a reality perspective on the science of our circumstance, then we will spend a lot of time and energy on things that don't matter or won't work. So it helps focus for me and others um, in this collapse course or this endeavor, focus our energies on that which has a chance of ennobling us or um, being productive. It's We don't do things in the sense of we're going to save the world, but we do things in the sense of this is meaningful and it's uplifting, it's compassionate work. And the whole perspective allows us to be more compassionate with ourselves and with each other. That's So one recommendation is to read more, learn more from the, the literature of Michael Dowd, who just died a couple of weeks ago, is a mentor in this area. And uh, he talks about post doom, no gloom, meaning how do we face the condition of the world full on, realistically, look at the science, and then not go into uh, doom and gloom, not go into despair, but in fact, go deeper into compassion. We find that compassion is the answer to personal and global problems. My experience of playing with this is it brings that front and center, focuses me, focuses us specifically on that. Another thing, that, one other recommendation, then uh, we've got easily 10, 15 minutes, no, minutes of conversation. Let me finish my sentence, Michael. Yes. One other recommendation is to understand the metaphor of hospice care that everything is born, grows, and dies at a local and also a global level at some point. And our sun is going to go dark at some point, not in my lifetime, but it will. So how do we face endings or how do we face death? And I know that in our culture, we've been phobic about acknowledging the reality of that. Thankfully, the hospice movement has allowed us to look square on at the end of a human lifetime and do that honorably and with dignity. And, and there's a lot of lessons in there that I'm grateful for. Uh, when Whitney's father and my father 
uh, was under hospice care, living at our house. Um, he uh, pulled a tube out of his kidney. He was uh, had kidney problems. And so they put him back in the hospital to reinsert the tube. Unfortunately, they did that on a Friday afternoon, as things always happen like that. And it took me almost 48 hours to get him pried back out of the hospital. They had every argument in the book about why they would not release him from the hospital. He might develop an infection. He might die. He needs to be watched by a nurse 24 hours. The insurance won't cover things. Um, you know, it, it could, we can't be responsible for something bad. Folks, hey, listen to yourselves. He was already under hospice care. You're trying to save his life, and he's already a terminally ill patient. Can you help switch gears here? Can you let him come home, live at home with us? That would be nice. But they were the system was completely geared in one direction, which was only to be life prolonging. I wouldn't even say life affirming. I would say life prolonging. So I knew enough about hospital systems to get him pried out of there, you know, um, but it took an awful lot of effort to overcome the resistance of the system to that. And so I would say it's helpful to draw lessons from the, the nobility um, and the integrity of the whole hospice movement to think about aspects of our own future. And this is the last thing I'll say that collapse is defined as a dramatic shrinkage in both population and resources as a, a relative to what we have previously experienced. And nobody knows exactly what's coming, but it's fair to say that we are facing shrinkage. All right. Thomas? Okay. So, if I might. Yeah, can Michael, I'm gonna make a request of you. Can you pose sure. Can you pose a question to the group for the group to consider I would like to rather make, than give us a comment, Thomas? Yeah, I'd like people to have a chance, Michael. Briefly, um, this was attempted before 200 years ago by Malthus, who made the statement that basically population would increase to a point exponentially that in such a way that the foods, the rate of food growth and development would not pace it. And at some point we would basically create so many people that there would be not enough food to feed them and people would starve to death. And that was called the Marth Malthusian equation. And of course it was again, a philosophical gloom and doom scenario. And I think I've read the Overshoot shoot book. It is, again, 45-year-old science. And uh, there is science in it. But again, I have four grandchildren, Thomas, and I believe in their future. And I think a lot of people fight for the future. I think there's a mixture of philosophy and science in this. But when you talk about this, you're almost, you know, sort of, sounds like you're getting ready to climb in the grave. Is this your point, or what are you, what point are you actually trying to make with this? Okay, well, thank you. Um, Malthus was right. That wasn't philosophy, that was prediction, and it all came true. So there is a dramatic shortage. There have been massive famines. We've just been insulated from them in this country. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not about, I said, this is a chilling conversation to face the facts of the science of climate change, people, we don't want to do that. I'm recommending that we do take a look at it. Um, it is true that the population, we've been in a population bomb explosion for as long as I can remember. And that is widely regarded as a major contributing factor to the existential crisis we're in. And it's widely recognized that those of us that have had a technological advantage, Homo Colossus, have had an outsized influence on creating the problem. And I think it's a widespread recognition that voluntary simplicity and shrinkage has been on our agenda for a long time. A long time. We just don't know how to do it well enough, quick enough, fast enough to shrink a population that's that big. 
So it's it's not meant to be terrorizing. It is meant to be realistic and to call people into a compassionate relationship to each other in the earth as we are willing to look into that reality. And I, you know, I don't, I was stunned when I found out that the book was 40 years old, or 45 years old. I was stunned because I felt like it was written yesterday. Um, so I hope that answers your question about my intent. Paul? So <clears throat> I'm an immigrant and our family, you know, came from England. And my father finally found a farm, 40 acres. 500 apple trees, three and a half acres of grapes, 10 acres of vegetables. So we were self-sufficient other than buying sugar and powder. And so I think as you're talking, how how it's not possible to make everyone self-sufficient anymore, right? And, and that creates a huge, huge issue sociologically. How do we, you know, keep our population fed and happy and all of that and but being self-sufficient that I was through college uh a lot of work <laughs> you know growing crops and picking apples and sell, going to the farmer's market and but I, I think very few people have had that experience so it's kind of hard to have them get what you're talking about so but I sure appreciate it it's really relevant to what's happening today. It's getting harder and harder for people to be self-sufficient. I draw comfort from two things. One is that we, as humans, we're not unique from participation in the ecological principles involved. All living systems go through the same cycle. It's not just us. And the second thing is me some comfort is that I was lucky enough to be born in a condition through no fault of my own where I was born into extreme economic privilege in the United States in the 1949. Extreme privilege. Most of the rest of the world is far more aware of the circumstances I'm describing than we have been. And we don't want to give up our comfort, but so I'm addicted to civilization. <laughs> I'm addicted to civilization as I've known it, and I don't want to give it up. I want another fix. <laughs> I want my car, <laughs> Prius though it is, you know. So it's partly recovering from being an addict to civilization is another way to think about all this. Whitney? You're on mute, sister. For me, um, it's the young people. It, compassion for young people and the future they're growing into. Most of us are seniors. And, um, and I've, you know, we haven't talked about how long this collapse is going to take. Um, and it could be a hundred years or two or for 30 years. It could, don't know. Uh, but young people like those grandchildren, everybody talks about, you know, the compassion that's the only answer. I mean, I don't know exactly how to express it. Just saying the word and just kind of tough breaks, young people. Good luck. Um, you know, their rage and anger that you didn't fix it. And we tried in the 70s or the 60s. I think there was a lot of effort. and But it's too big. It's too big. And... Um, I don't know the answers. I don't know how to express compassion for young people and their future. That's, but I wanted to bring it up. One way to start there is that I've found that this perspective helps explain an awful lot of current events. It helps me understand them. I understand now that the young people coming up now, they, did, they weren't born and raised in an age of exuberance like we were. So that's what Catton calls that cheap oil expansion, optimistic period. He calls it the age of exuberance. And young people weren't raised with that. That's not their hope. That's not their expectation. They know the world isn't like that. So the contrast is they live in a realistic world. 
I lived in a dream world. And so I, I have more sympathy or connection or understanding from that point of view about young people. Somebody else, what's on your mind? Sarah? Um, I can't think of the name of the book, but Mendel Berry, who's a great poet, but he was also a farmer, wrote a book uh, sort of along the lines that you're talking about. And in it, he makes the argument that the only way for us to to improve our situation and to care about the earth is to uh, to learn to grow something, to get our hands dirty and grow. And he makes the argument that you cannot have compassion for the earth until you have actually grown a garden, even if it's a little thing on your balcony. Um, and uh, I, I found that really powerful and uh, I've actually started going it, doing it and it's in a tiny balcony that I have and it's totally changed my relationship to to the way I consume things, the way I consume resources and um, has been really powerful. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. It could have been any one of his numerous wonderful books. Yeah, I can't think of the name right now. I'm yeah. a huge fan, huge fan. So I'm, I'm aware that about half the people have gone dark, as it were, stopped their videos. And so I make up the story that this may be a conversation or a point of view that is out of step with the spirit of Mastery Circle. Uh, I, I would imagine for some people it must be. I, I just want to account for that. That's all. Ruth, what you got? Yes. I mean, this cannot be considered for me without considering AI and what's happening in that world and, and the Ray Kurzweilers of the world who are suggesting that eventually we won't need food at all. We'll just all be attached to one giant brain. We won't need clothing and our existence will be only part of a one huge uh, organism that grows in intelligence and self-sufficiency every moment. And that I'm not a fan of Ray Kurzweiler at all. As a matter of fact, if we, a lot of people who were discussing what happened during the pandemic would go back to the same video of Bill Gates announcing how uh, the, um, vaccinations was going to help the world because it was going to reduce the population, which sounds kind of counter <laughs> intuitive that you give vaccinations to preserve life. Supposedly, that's what the point of it was. But so what is he talking about controlling populations? So and we know he's been buying a lot of farmland in central uh, United States. So, you know, I don't know whether we can think about this subject without thinking about what planning is going on behind the scenes for civilization. And so, of course, it's a very startling topic, but what's even more startling is that there might be a group of people who are uh, planning to reduce the population so that they can have a better life themselves, you know, and, and most people are just not even connected or attached to that kind of thinking. They're too busy trying to find the day's food for their family. So it is a very, very powerful and startling concept to deal with. And, um, you know, but I can't I can't think of it without the with the revolution that's going on right now. And the fact that Sam Halperin, you know, was fired and then rehired because he wanted to put brakes on technology and have some ethics be considered. So there is an ethical question here, Thomas. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, thanks for raising the issue of planning, because rest assured that the United States military and intelligence community have understood and been looking at these issues for a long, long time. And there are plenty of contingency plans for the U.S. Uh, that already exist. And of course, they're not publicized. I see Melanie, I see Bill, and I saw one other hand just pop up a minute ago, Brooke. So Melanie, Bill, and Brooke. Well, I just, you've really 
rattled my cage in terms of what's what's real and the illusion, you know, that we grew up with, that, that they, you know, your whole, the whole explanation. And I'm from Iowa. My dad was raised as a farmer and he was a feed manufacturer and always owned land and his he was certain everything would always be okay. There'll always be enough food. You're being crazy, blah, blah, blah. And I just think of all the people in the Midwest who, you know, or, or in different parts of the United States where we're so, there's still so much abundance and there's still land and there's still water. And, you know, the state of the world right now not even talking about, you know, losing all the resources, but just the state of our inability to um, get along and not war and and be concerned about all the people really suffering. You know, we saw, I mean, you know, just the, the issue of where our garbage goes and our resources and, you know, that people in, in, Africa are, you know, going through our garbage to find little pieces of metal to be able to feed their family. It's, it's horrifying. And I, you know, I, for one, this is, a, it's a alarming reality every day. That's all. Thanks, Bill. Bill? Just to note, we have about three minutes left in this section. Okay, I'll be real fast then. Um, yeah, I, I kind of echo what uh, Melanie said. It's very startling, um, depressing, and yet it was a, a shot of medicine that I needed to hear. So uh, I do want to thank you for that. Uh, compassion, and I think if we we as a mastery circle embrace, I mean, it's it's a it's a sad sad <laughs> um, facts here, but. Um, with compassion and I love the hospice analogy. Uh, and finally, if you could if you could slide anybody slide references that you've made to books uh, into the chat there uh, I, or authors, I think that would be very helpful for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brooke. Yeah, um, so, so I would come back to you, Thomas, and ask you, so what is, if there's a gap between the mastery circle point of view and a, uh, a a reality connected point of view, uh, you know, what is the best way to deal with this? You're, you're basically telling us if you're not careful, we're going to end up where we're headed. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm a firm believer in trust Allah, but tether your camel. Um, so beyond those slogans, what what is the right attitude for people like us to attitude and actions to take toward um this not entirely happy situation? Well, in less than one minute, um, I would say uh, get into a group of people who are willing to talk about what they're learning about the most recent science. Uh, thank you, Afton, for that reference in chat. Um, I can get you connected with more resources later. Um, Yeah, I would just say be connected uh, with communities that are willing to explore and support each other in this inquiry. If I have one sentence, that would be it. Um, there's there's a lot that we don't know, uh, other than that indigenous communities have been referring to the end of the world as we know it, Tiatawaki, um, as, as something that they have a lot of experience with that a lot of middle-class whites don't have. Jared Diamond's book, uh, thank you, Kieran, is another good reference. So I'm sorry that brings us to the end of, of this. I um, appreciate your indulgence for floating these very difficult ideas. And um, I'll give it back to you, Paul. 